When a young boy consistently arrives late for school, his teacher grows concerned and opts to accompany him home to investigate if there's an underlying issue. However, what she observes shatters her heart and prompts her to burst into tears. Miss Indigo, a dedicated and compassionate teacher, began her first class of the day with her usual enthusiasm. However, her focus was broken when a familiar boy walked into the room, causing her to frown and her heart to sink. It was Jordan, a student whose family lived a few miles out of town. He was a nice enough boy, but there had been some recent issues that gave her cause for concern. You see, Miss Indigo had noticed over the past six months that Jordan had been consistently late and arrived at school covered in sweat. While he put in effort and clearly had the aptitude and attitude to learn, his academic performance had undeniably taken a hit. And his grades had plummeted. It was evident that something was amiss. And the fact that he was nearly 30 minutes late each day was simply unacceptable. To make matters worse, there were instances when Jordan would fall asleep during class. Overwhelmed by fatigue and exhaustion, this drastic change in behavior was in stark contrast to how bright and alert he used to be, deeply concerning Miss Indigo and prompting her to take action. One day, fueled by her desire to help Jordan, Miss Indigo made a bold decision. She decided to follow him home after school, hoping to uncover the source of the problem. If she could figure out the issue, then maybe she could help. As the bell rang, Signaling the end of the school day, Miss Indigo quickly slipped away and hurried to her car, patiently waiting for Jordan's parents to pick him up. The concerned teacher then trailed them, hoping to uncover any clues that might help explain things. However, to her surprise, the boy began walking alone. Confusion flooded Miss Indigo's mind as she deliberated whether to intervene. She knew that his home was a few good miles away and it would be a long trek to make the journey completely on foot. Still, her concern for Jordan led her to step out of the car and discreetly follow him from a distance. There was clearly something concerning and wrong here, but she just couldn't pinpoint what it was. With frustration in her steps, she tailed the boy along his trip. The journey through the city and towards the town where Jordan lived was long and arduous, especially with a storm threatening to set in. Despit. E the distance. It seemed as though Jordan knew the route like the back of his hand. Several hours passed. And eventually, they reached Jordan's humble abode. Miss Indigo hid a distance away behind a tree. Just like Jordan, the house looked tired and in need of maintenance. She could see his parents through a dirty window, preparing a meager meal. As the rain started to fall, several leaks caused the ceilings inside the house to start dripping. The sight was shocking to Miss Indigo. She had no idea that Jordan and his family lived this way. She believed them to have a nice house and a happy life. But what she was seeing seemed like the opposite of that. The sad sight caused tears to well up in her eyes. Determined to understand the situation fully, Miss Indigo wiped away her tears, called a taxi, and quietly made her way home, her mind racing with thoughts of how to help. The following day, Miss Indigo scheduled a meeting with Jordan's parents, Michael and Amy. She didn't want to reveal that she had followed their son. But on the other hand, she wanted to help. It was a tricky situation. And she would have to navigate the worrisome waters delicately. Welcoming Michael and Amy into the school office, Miss Indigo sat down opposite them, once again struggling to hold back tears. A mix of anxiety and hope filled the room as they arrived at the school bracing themselves for the unexpected discussion. In a gentle and understanding manner, Miss Indigo empathetically approached the topic, explaining her concern for Jordan's well-being and how she was worried about his grades and lateness. As the parents spoke, tears welled up in their eyes as they revealed the hardships their family had been enduring over the past year. Their car had been repossessed to settle unpaid bills, impacting their employment and financial stability. This meant that they had been forced to move out of the city to a more affordable home. Also, Jordan's daily six-mile trek to school became a necessity due to their very limited resources. This confirmed Miss Indigo's suspicions about Jordan's constant lateness and physical state. If he made that journey each and every day, it was no wonder he was always so tired and worn out. Filled with compassion and determination, 
Miss Indigo assured Michael and Amy that she was committed to assisting them in any way possible. Apologizing for the issue. The parents promised to make an effort to ensure that Jordan left for school even earlier than before. Deter. Mind to help him arrive on time. Education was very important to them. And they wanted their boy to get the best so he wouldn't have to worry about financial struggles in the future. It was a small step forward. But Miss Indigo knew that it wouldn't help. As Jordan would be even more tired throughout the day. Surely. There was more that could be done. That night. Miss Indigo couldn't fall asleep because she couldn't stop thinking about Jordan's sad story. Her mind kept replaying the sorry state of his home and how Michael and Amy were. Struggling to stay afloat while still supporting their boy to go to school and thrive. No family should have to go through something like that. Miss Indigo kept tossing and turning in bed. Wondering if there was something she could do to make things easier for the family. Then. A hopeful idea came to her. The very next morning. She decided to contact the charity that helps families in need. She told them about Jordan's situation and asked if they could help find people who might want to help. After several weeks of waiting, Miss Indigo's selfless perseverance finally paid off. A kind-hearted stranger, deeply touched by Jordan's story, appeared out of nowhere and brought about an incredible change. Not only did this generous donor arrange for Jordan to have a bicycle for a quicker and easier journey to school, but they also went above and beyond by gifting the family a car. This remarkable act of kindness not only made it easier for Michael and Amy to travel to work, but it also significantly improved the family's financial stability. It truly promised a brighter and more hopeful future for the entire family. Miss Indigo, filled to the brim with gratitude and joy, couldn't contain her excitement as she shared the incredible news with Jordan and his family. Overwhelmed by emotion, Michael and Amy shed tears of both relief and deep appreciation, realizing that they could finally get their life back on track and get themselves back onto their feet. This simple act of compassion and empathy would forever change the lives of the small family. And they would be eternally grateful to Miss Indigo and the anonymous donor. Their lives became forever intertwined in a powerful and enduring bond that would never be broken. As the days pressed on, Jordan's gray started to bounce back and he blossomed academically. Once again, he was no longer arriving at school covered in sweat or falling asleep mid-lesson. Now, he was as bright and attentive as he had ever been. His spark reignited within the classroom, and he started socializing once again. He wasn't the exhausted boy who showed up late anymore, but a cool kid whose bike everybody envied. Miss Indigo, feeling a large amount of pride in the boy reveled in Jordan's resilience and determination, knowing she had made a lasting impact not only in his life but in the lives of his family. This heartwarming tale serves as a powerful reminder of the profound impact that empathy and compassion have on the lives of others. Through her unwavering dedication, Miss Indigo not only helped restore Jordan's potential but also ignited a flame of hope in the hearts of all those who witnessed this remarkable journey. What did you think of this incredible story? How would you have felt if you discovered Jordan's terrible living conditions? Would you have strived to help him and his family as Miss Indigo did? Then, let's move on to the next story. As dusk slowly thickened over the city, the citizens, as usual, turned down their TV sets and adjusted themselves to sleep. Only in the maternity ward of the city hospital was the light on. And there was a quiet conversation between the two nurses. Ellen, how long are you going to grieve? He's gone. So good riddance. Ginny said. Trying to find the right words to reassure her friend. Yes. I understand everything. I just loved him very much. I'm sure it's because I could not give him a son in ten years. All his friends are fathers. And I'm barren. Who needs me like this at thirty-nine? Exclaimed Alan with tears in her eyes. A normal man will never leave a good wife. Life has liberated you from him replied Ginny. In response to this, Alan only kept silent. It was easy for Ginny to say that because she had a loving husband and children waiting for her at home, Ellen really did not want to go back to the apartment where, after Paul's leaving, everything seemed so joyless. Work as a nurse in a maternity hospital was her only consolation. Every day, seeing the happy faces of parents holding their babies in their arms, 
Ellen felt a barely perceptible sense of envy. She wanted, just like these young mothers, to hold her baby in her arms and surround him with love and care. Ellen had dreamed of becoming a nurse since childhood. She loved to put on her mother's white chef's coat and look for a long time at her reflection in the mirror. Imagining herself as a nurse, her mother saw her daughter's desire and supported her wholeheartedly. After SCO, O.L., Ellen enrolled at nursing school, eventually finding herself working in a maternity hospital. Ellen often warmly remembered her mother, who helped make her cherished dream come true. Unfortunately, an insidious illness took her dear mother's life just six months ago, and Ellen suffered severely from the loss of such a dear person. Now, Paul had left her for another woman. From a state of painful memories, Ellen was brought out by Ginny's voice. Ellen. Let's go to the seventh ward. There's a woman in labor brought in in serious condition. They say she got sick at the train station and lost consciousness. Apparently. A homeless woman. Her belly is huge. Maybe she has twins. I feel a difficult delivery is ahead of us. Ellen immediately dismissed her sad thoughts and followed her friend. To her surprise. The woman in labor turned out to be very young. She did not even look twenty years old and was on the verge of physical exhaustion. Ellen approached the girl with care and concern, asking her how she was feeling and what her name was. In the girl's eyes, there immediately sparkled a light of hope that she would be helped here and would not be judged. Her name was Sandra. But Ellen couldn't learn more before Sandra began having incessant contractions. An hour later, three twins, two boys and a girl, were born. The doctor who headed the department, wiping his forehead with a damp napkin tiredly muttered, This is unbelievable. Colleagues. In my practice. This is the first such case. However. Sandra didn't look happy at all. There were tears in the corner of her huge, Bambi-like eyes. And it was clear that there was not an ounce of joy in them. In the evening. When the excitement around the unusual birthing woman gradually faded. Ellen looked into the ward to Sandra. Why are you sad? Honey. You should be proud of yourself. Such happiness. Three babies. Many people only dream of this. In response. Sandra wiped away a tear and sniffed her nose. Replying briefly. I have nothing to be happy about. Some people are happy. Others are not. After these words. She turned to the wall. Alan shook her head and went to her post. The night promised to pass quietly. And the woman was spending the time reading some unpretentious novel about love. However. She was not destined to enjoy a book like that. Ellen who always reacted sensitively to any noise, suddenly heard the collective crying of a few babies, cautiously walking down the corridor. She realized that the crying was coming from the ward with three babies. When the nurse opened the door, she saw that the window was wide open, and there was no one in the room except the three crying babies. Apparently, Sandra had run away from the maternity ward. Oh my God! How could it be? Why did your mother leave you? whispered Ellen, taking each of the babies in her arms in turn to comfort them. Soon, the news that Sandra had escaped spread throughout the maternity ward. Ellen, your shift is nearly over. It's time to go home. Your eyes are already red from lack of sleep, said Ginny, hugging her friend by the shoulders. Jenny, thank you for your concern, but I'll be on duty some more. I'm not tired at all. I'll sit with them. No one needs them. You know they're not your family. And they'll never be. You know that very well. Good luck with that. I'm going home. Said Ginny in farewell. Ellen. Meanwhile. Continued to care for the babies. Even though she had already had a legal day off. And only at the request of the head of the maternity department. The woman agreed to go home to rest. But instead of resting. Ellen went to the guardianship office to find out about her chances of adopting a baby. Don't get us wrong. But we cannot grant your request. Your marital status does not allow us to give you three children to raise. You are divorced. And a nurse's salary would hardly allow you to provide for such a large family. Improve your living. Family. And financial conditions. And then submit your application for adoption. The children will stay in an orphanage for now said the child welfare officer. 
In frustration, Ellen went home. Such injustice could not be imagined in her mind. That day, Ellen was crying until the evening. The bitterness of being separated from the babies squeezed her heart, causing unbearable heartache, imperceptibly rustling the pages of a tear-off calendar. Three months flew by. All this time, Ginny had been dissuading her friend from trying to get custody of the babies. Ellen, please come to your senses. Why do you need such a burden on your neck? Three children are very heavy. You should arrange your life, urged Ginny. But you're trying to arrange others. You don't understand. Ginny, I love them. And I feel like they're family to me. And I have enough time to fix my personal life. Confidently answered Ellen, who had been visiting the kids at the orphanage on weekends all this time. Once on her way home from work, Ellen saw Sandra. She seemed tired and exhausted which made her look a few years older. At first, Ellen intended to just walk by, but then, nevertheless, she approached the negligent mother and said, Hello. I see that you do not even suffer from conscience. How is it possible to abandon your children and live on your own as if it has nothing to do with you? In response, the girl lowered her eyes and, wiping away the flood of tears, said, You see, I came to the capital from the provinces. I was 18. I was promised a job as a maid in a hotel. But they tricked me into working in. I got pregnant by a client. And they threw me out. No place to live. No money. I wanted to end my life. And I couldn't. I am weak-willed. Do you have any relatives? Asked Ellen. Shocked by the girl's confession. No one. I'm an orphan. Answered Sandra bursting into tears. All right. All right. Sweetheart. Stop it. Come with me. Stop wandering the streets. Or you'll get in trouble. Offered Ellen. Taking the girl by the hand. Already at home. Over a cup of tea. She told Sandra that the babies were named Thomas. Molly. And Greg. Are they really doing well? The girl asked hopefully. Yes. And I visit them from time to time replied Ellen, who heard in the girl's voice notes of care and longing for the children. The next day, Ellen helped Sandra find a job. One of her friends worked in a supermarket and had long complained that it did not have enough cashiers in the sales area. Sandra, upon hearing this, happily jumped at the offer. There you go. Honey. See. Life is getting better little by little. Now we have to think hard about how to get the kids back. Said Ellen. Smiling. This time, before going to the guardianship, the woman prepared more thoroughly. She took references from her workplace and data on income. She did not forget to consult a lawyer so that she knew all the ins and outs of applying for guardianship. The guardianship service was very surprised to see Ellen for the second time. But now the woman's paperwork was flawless. And her petition was approved. Thanks to her persistence and perseverance. After a month or so, Ellen and Sandra were able to take the children out of the orphanage. Since they worked in shifts, they took turns caring for the children, filling in for each other. Time passed quickly, and before the happy women could look back, the year flew by. Sandra had already adapted to work in the supermarket and was considered one of the best salespersons. Ellen, as before, worked in the maternity ward, helping women in labor. But only now she found Maya. Ning in her life. If before she used to come home from work to an empty apartment. Now she was greeted by the cheerful hubbub and joyful laughter of children. For Ellen. Happiness could not be considered complete without a loved one near. But she preferred not to dwell on it. As for Sandra. A pleasant young man appeared in her life. The modest girl rarely talked about him. But Ellen knew that his name was Edward and he was a security guard at the same supermarket where Sandra worked. Their relationship developed gradually. At first, it was just shy mutual glances and smiles, but over time it came down to a first date. Sandra was afraid that Edward, upon hearing that she was a mother of three, would leave her. But the man, to his credit, was very decent, and he was not embarrassed by the three children of his beloved girlfriend. As it turned out, the guy was raised by his father. And for most of his childhood, 
He grew up without his mother. Are you in love? Sandra asked Ellen. I am. You know. He's so nice. And he asked me to marry him. We've already set the date. It's just going to be a ceremony with friends. And then we're gonna celebrate at a restaurant. Ellen replied. Wow. That's news. Well done. And thanks for letting me know in time because I do not have a proper dress. Said Ellen. Smiling. Happy that things were going well with Sandra. The month flew by. And the long-awaited wedding day arrived. At the ceremony. The young couple invited their colleagues and Edward's father. After the newlyweds exchanged rings and went to the restaurant. Ellen decided to go home. To her surprise. George. Edward's father. Volunteered to escort her. Well. What should I do here with the young people? Let them have fun. He explained. Seeing Ellen's questioning look. On their way to Ellen's house. They got to talking. The man said that after his wife's death. He had not been able to tie his life to anyone. We fought for her life for a long time. But it was all to no avail. Explained the man. Whose voice sounded sad. Upon entering Ellen's apartment. He immediately noticed that her house was missing a man's hand. The hinges of your door are creaking. They need oiling. And the hanger in the hallway could fall off. Why don't I come over tomorrow with some tools and fix everything? Asked George. Yes. I do not mind. And now there is a cake waiting for us. Said Ellen with a smile. The evening passed in a pleasant and comfortable atmosphere. And Ellen caught herself thinking that she had no. T had such a good rest for a long time. They played together with the children. And then George went home. It is worth saying that George kept his promise. And within a week. He fixed Ellen's apartment. The woman was pleased to have such a welcomed and pleasant guest. Unnoticed by themselves. Their relationship grew from friendly to something more. And now it was Sandra's turn to be happy for Ellen. Of course. At first. Ellen and George did not show off their relationship and were as shy as teenagers. But then they announced themselves as a couple. To the delight of Sandra and Edward. Wow. Now we have another wedding waiting for us. The joyful newlyweds exclaimed in unison. In response. Ellen and George just smiled. And three months later. They legalized their relationship. Ellen went to live with George. Who had a small house outside the city. Sandra often brought the children there at Ellen's invitation. And there. Among nature and clean air. Ellen finally felt completely happy. There was a beloved man beside her. Triplets whom she loved as her own. Happy Sandra whom she considered her little sister. And about six months later. Ellen found out that she was pregnant. It is hard to say who was most excited about this news. But they both were sure that happiness and love settled in their home for a long time. Let's continue. What happened to your husband all of a sudden? Jessica said thoughtfully. He used to be a normal man. He loved you. But now. Yeah. Andrea sighed. Lately. He's as if he's been replaced. Comes home late. Rude all the time. And says it's all because of the load at work and fatigue. And what does he lack? You're such a smart. Beautiful girl. These men are never satisfied. Andrea notched in agreement. She and her friend met in a cafe to distract from the gray of everyday life. But it did not work. The conversation inevitably came down to a discussion of their hard women's lot. Why don't you have a baby? Asked Jessica. Maybe at least fatherhood will make Douglas come to his senses. Sometimes it helps. He doesn't want kids. We've been together for seven years. And his only answer is we need to live for ourselves. Besides. We've been sleeping in separate bedrooms for a month. So the question of children is definitely closed. Andrea explained. Taking a sip of an Americano. She thought about the fact that her family life became as bitter as this coffee. She met Douglas when they were both 17 years old. It happened by chance and was probably the biggest mist. Ache in her life. Her father had died early. And her mother brought her up in austerity. An outlet for her was a music class where she went to learn the flute. The teacher predicted a great future for her. But Andrea never thought about it seriously. She simply loved the atmosphere of the classes and the boy William who practiced with her. She didn't even remember what she liked better. The music lessons. 
or the cheerful chit-chat on the way home. William was a year younger than Andrea. He was a little clumsy. And he also wore glasses. So he was not a success among his classmates. Yesterday in physical training. I embarrassed myself again. I had to climb a rope. And earlier I mowed the neighbor's lawn and got a blister. Therefore. I could not climb even a meter. Everyone was laughing so loudly. William said one day. Those who laugh at you are shallow people. Snorted Andrea. In today's world. It's much more important to be smart and knowledgeable. And you are all right with that. Who won the computer science contest? You did. And computers are the future. Said Andrea confidently. Thank you for your support. It means a lot to me. Blushing. Murmured William. On Valentine's Day. Andrea. Among the heart-shaped cards from her girlfriends. Found one from William. The next day. William asked if she liked his card and immediately blushed profusely. Andrea looked at him closely and suddenly realized that this was important to him. She thanked him. And on an impulse. Kissed him on the cheek. Why? I didn't give you a card. And I don't have anything else with me. Shrugged Andrea. They did not talk about what happened anymore. But from that moment. William looked at her as if he was ready for any feat for her sake. Maybe their relationship would have developed into something more. But then Douglas came rushing into Andrea's measured life like a whirlwind. It happened in early spring. William got sick with the flu. And that prohibited Andrea from visiting him so as not to infect her. So Andrea had to go to the music lesson alone. It was unusually boring and even a little scary because the way from school was along the abandoned construction site. At the dark time of day, the usual ruins turned into ominous shadows. The girl walked and trembled with fear. Suddenly, out of the darkness in front of her, an unfamiliar guy suddenly jumped out and asked in an impudent tone what time it was. She was so shaken that she couldn't see the face of the clock. It's half past eight. She said at R. Andam. Hoping the guy would back off. It's dangerous for girls to be out here at this time. He grinned. Andrea was going to run away. But she stumbled and fell to the ground. The guy grabbed her arm as if to help. And Andrea screamed in desperation. Calling for help. What's going on here? Her voice was heard. And another figure popped out of the darkness. The first guy immediately visibly shrank. And a frightened note appeared in his voice. Oh. That crazy girl decided to sit a little on the ground. I wanted to help. And she screamed. Maybe it was you who scared her. Said the stranger. All right. Go. I'll take care of it myself. Said the stranger. And the first guy immediately disappeared. The stranger walked up to Andrea. Held out his hand. And helped her up. He reassured her. Said she was safe. And offered to walk her home. Andrea. Looking at the road drowning in darkness. Agreed. When they came out onto the lighted street. Andrea recognized Douglas. The guy was a local hottie who threw parties and raced a sports bike. All the girls were crazy about him. After learning that Andrea often returned home alone in the evenings, Douglas volunteered to accompany her. By the time William recovered, rumors about Andrea's new boyfriend had reached him. He did not ask anything about it and simply stopped going to music school. And then, in general, he moved with his parents to another district. Three years later, Andrea and Douglas decided to get married. Her mother did not approve of her choice. She saw that Douglas did not think about the future. Loved only to have fun. And she was seriously concerned about how the young couple were going to live. The woman tried to dissuade her daughter. But she was sure that she and Douglas could handle everything. Growing up, Andrea realized how right her mother was. The years passed. But her husband did not even think of becoming more responsible. He was interested in nothing but motorcycles and hanging out with friends. He earned odd jobs and didn't want to change anything in his life. Even Andrea, working as a secretary, earned more than him. Many times she tried to talk sense into Douglas. First, it was to no avail. It's my vocation to deal with bikes. Do you really want me to bury my talent in the ground because of a few extra dollars? resented Douglas during their quarrels. And Andrea left the subject. She felt sorry for her husband and continued to love him. 
but he was trampling on her feelings without thinking about it. Lately, Andrea felt that he was in love with another woman. She tried to convince herself that it was just her fantasy. But a call from her friend Jessica changed everything. Hi honey. Sit down if you're standing. I just saw your hubby come out of the restaurant with some dressed up lady. I followed them. And they disappeared into a hotel. Come over. We'll give them a real show. Andrea drove in a cab. Deep in her heart hoping that her friend had simply mistaken Douglas with someone similar. Triumphant. Jessica was waiting for her at the hotel. She had already cunningly found out the number of the room where the two had retreated. And she was almost jumping in anticipation of exposing the wretched hubby. The friends went up to the third floor. Jessica knocked on the door. And Andrea was standing still. Hoping that it was a mistake. Hearing her husband's disgruntled voice from behind the door. There was no doubt. Douglas opened the door and stunningly stared at his wife without giving him a minute to recover. Andrea quickly entered the room and saw a half-naked woman on the bed. Then she gave her husband a resounding slap and ran out of the room. Jessica caught up with her friend downstairs. You did the right thing. That's what he needs, cry or shout if you like. But don't keep it to yourself. I want a drink. Said Andrea quietly. The friends went to the nearest bar. And after a couple of glasses of wine. Andrea cried and said how she hated Douglas because he ruined her life. Jessica, having treated Andrea with cognac, dragged her into a karaoke. And sad thoughts almost completely left Andrea's head. Already at midnight, the girls went out on the street. Andrea wanted to call a cab, but she couldn't find her phone in her bag for a long time. And Jessica decided to try her luck and hitch a ride. Would anyone refuse to do a favor for pretty girls like us? She declared. But the drivers drove by. And the ones that stopped invited them only to continue the evening in a cozy spot. Suddenly. A black SUV pulled up next to them. The window lowered. And Andrea stared in amazement at William's face. So familiar. Almost unchanged over the years. Hi. Where do you need to go? The man asked. As if nothing had happened. Jessica needs to go home. Said Andrea in a weak voice. As for me. I don't know yet. She added faintly. Is this your friend? Asked Jessica curiously. An old friend. Answered William. For Andrea. Jessica jumped in the back seat and became quiet. Andrea sat down next to William. And. While they were driving. She only glanced sideways at him. Noting how manly and respectable her old friend had become today. None of the girls who had laughed at him as a child would have stayed indifferent. The car stopped in front of Jessica's driveway. She thanked William and winking at Andrea. Headed for home. Shall I take you home? The man asked uncertainly. No. I'm not ready right now. Andrea shook her head. Will you tell me what happened? Asked William. Andrea was not used to sharing her problems with everyone but perhaps because of the alcohol or William's presence. She suddenly nodded. They got out of the car and wandered through the alleys of a nearby park while Andrea told William her story. This is how my life has turned out. I'm filing for divorce tomorrow. But I'm glad I met you today because I wanted to apologize for leaving you back then. No. It was my own fault. William shook his head. I should have fought for you when I gave up. Honestly. I should be thanking you. You were the only one who believed in me. Maybe without your support. I wouldn't have gotten anywhere. Actually. My married life is no better than yours. I'm on the verge of divorce. My wife has only shopping and travel on her mind. We live like strangers. If then many years ago I was able to keep you. Andrea looked into his eyes. So. Keep me at least today. They went to William's apartment where he was living when he wanted to be apart from his wife. It was the first night of love in their lives. And Andrea realized that she had never loved Douglas. In the morning. Andrea embarrassedly entered the kitchen. William cheerfully kissed her cheek and said that breakfast was almost ready. The girl timidly sat down on a chair. And William asked what was wrong. Carefully choosing her words. Andrea apologized for the things she had said to him last night and for coming here. William threw his fork on the plate with a jingle. Andrea. I need you. I realize that today. Marry me. 
he asked in a dropped voice. But you are married. Aren't you? So am I. Andrea looked at him with an incomprehensible look. It doesn't mean anything. We made a mistake. But we are meant for each other. And we should be together. I'm filing for divorce. And you could too. In a few months. We'll be free. Andrea hugged William and said she would marry him. After breakfast. He drove Andrea home. Promising to call her back. Andrea immediately told her cheating husband that she was divorcing him. Now you can go out with your me. Stresses as much as you want. You're free. Douglas tried to object. But Andrea didn't let him finish and disappeared into the bedroom. Slamming the door in his face. The next few days passed in lingering anticipation of a call from William. But the phone was silent. Then Andrea decided to call herself. To her surprise. A woman who introduced herself as William's wife picked up the phone and said that Andrea could discuss all questions with her. Where is William? She asked immediately. Sensing something bad. He had an accident and now he's in intensive care. He's in a coma. But the doctors don't give any guarantees. Said William's wife indifferently and hung up. Andrea was horrified. In half an hour. She and Jessica were already in the hospital. But she could not get to William as she was nobody to him. Jessica calmed her friend and said that if William woke up and recovered. He would find Andrea himself. There was no other way out. And Andrea went home. Packed her things. And moved in with her mother. A month later. She realized that she was pregnant by William. Her son was born right on time. And Andrea did not even think about the name. She named him William in memory of her beloved. Andrea still lived with her mother and had no idea whether her beloved was still alive. A year passed. One day. As usual. She went to the park for a walk with her son. The boy was running. Chasing pigeons. Andrea wanted to warn the child. Fearing that he would fall. But did not have time. He was picked up in the arms of a man. Andrea looked at him and could not believe her eyes. William. You're alive. Yes. With God's help. He said calmly. I only came to my senses half a year ago. I divorced my wife and started looking for you. By some miracle. I remembered the address of your friend Jessica. And she told me where I could meet you. And don't be offended that she didn't tell you anything. I asked her because I wanted to surprise you. They were quiet for a while. Maybe it's too late already. But I have to ask. Do you still agree to be my wife? Asked William hopefully. Yes. Nodded Andrea happily. Well. Son. Shall we go see your new house? William asked the boy. The boy ran happily. And the doves. As angels blessing the family. With the rustlings of their wings. Flew up. Well. That's all for today's story. If you like it. Please subscribe and give it a thumbs up. See you next time.